This is the year that we're going to have major elections across the whole European Union to vote in a new European Parliament. And when those people turn up in Brussels and Strasbourg, they're going to be making decisions that affect the lives of a half a billion people across our continent. So it's really important that they start making decisions and get them right to deal with the big ecological crisis we're dealing with, like climate change and biodiversity loss, pollution and so on. So my report sets out some key ideas for how we could improve the EU's environmental performance, but also think about reviewing it from an ecological point of view to make it truly greener in its institutions as well as its policies. You know, there are quite a variety of views about um, where the European Union is going, what needs to be done with it, certain of the reforms that can be made to it, um, you know, its role in the world at the moment. And those are some of the big questions which certainly uh, our publication tonight that Alex is going to be presenting deals with quite a number of those questions. But what could we do now to try and move us towards a greener union? And here's where I think there are five key things that all green MEPs could try and do if they are elected uh, into the new parliament in May and June. First, really take its commitment to fighting climate change and take it seriously. And if they take the, their obligation seriously and invoke an article which really exists in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, Article 11, which says that environmental concerns must be mainstreamed into all EU policies, then we could almost overnight green the single currency and green EU energy policy. Certainly a couple of politicians I've debated with recently have said, yes, the climate's changing, but they haven't accepted that that's anything to do with our carbon emissions. Secondly, radical reform of the common agricultural policy. It has, over time, had led to massive overproduction of all sorts of agricultural goods, and it has also, over time, come to favour the big interests, the big agro-industries, rather than the smaller farmers. That's absolutely true. I think that the basis for the policy, though, would need to change. At the moment, it doesn't focus enough on food security, which is ironic, because that was its original objective. And if we take that back and make it front and centre again, the common agricultural policy could be a really useful tool to have, given that all the power in agricultural policy is already at EU level, to green production systems of food and distribution systems of food across 28 countries and half a billion people. Personally speaking, I think food security is one of the key issues that we're going to face in the cities and in the countryside and in the cities across the developing world. The lack of food security and the lack of affordable, good quality food is going to generally, and I think, stimulate further mass migrations, further events, maybe even conflicts. I just wanted to say about a bio-region. It's an area of the world that's defined by natural systems like mountains and rivers and things like that, rather than political boundaries, which are a bit artificial. In the report itself, I argue for a Europe of the bio-regions, where power is transferred down to the bioregional level and up to the European level, and the national level retains uh, residual competences, basically in ensuring standards of social and economic and ecological justice within state borders. If we redefined regions for the purpose of EU finance as bioregions, and took our lead for the delimitation of what counts as a region from what counts biologically and ecologically as a region, we could do two things almost overnight. First is we could start getting the idea of bioregions out there and using them politically and practically as a means of actually operating policy. But it would also mean by by greening cohesion policy and regional development policy, that not just would you change the structures, but you could also change the policy content as well. And if you greened the cohesion policy and made it truly focus on shifting towards a sustainable way of living, low carbon society and so on, then you've got two things already sorted out in my transition to a green European Union. You've got bioregions being established as viable political structures, and you've got the EU's existing funds 
being used as far as they can to foster a new green economic deal? I disagree in the sense it's, of course, the question of the bioregions. So first of all, I don't know what it means. I don't know how many bioregions it will be in Belgium or in France. But I am also not convinced that it is a very good promising idea to campaign. In the member states, you can't do away with them. By all means, we need to decentralize, spread power much more widely. Um, make things much less dependent on the member states and the council of ministers. But we've got to bear in mind the practicality of it, which is particularly since the Maastricht Treaty, the EU has been um, uh, a composition of member states. What's What's valuable about what Alex is doing here is he's 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 not looking at the world as it is. He's imagining how the world might be. And so I think if we're going to have to defend bioregions, we also have to defend nation states. I think nation states are a particular political form that grew up in the 19th century. They were, they were associated with colonialism, they were associated with a lot of political uh, features which we don't value anymore, and maybe we need to evolve beyond them, and that's, I think, what Alex is, is visioning, the possibility of doing that. Greening Europe can't be just about Europe. It can't be just about being parochially continental. Instead, one of the strengths of Europe could be, and to some extent has been, its role in the external world, outside its own borders. Now, the EU doesn't always cover itself with glory when it comes to dealing with third countries, and I'm not for a minute pretending that it does. But it is the world's biggest giver of development aid. And if the EU used that development aid for proper ecological purposes and said, we're going to give you this money, but we will have green strings attached to it, that would massively help not just the policies, sorry, the, the countries in receipt of that aid, but also the countries that give that aid, because it would start getting them thinking about cross border solidarity in a truly green way. What can we do about the state aid rules? Well, we, we could change the state aid rules, and I believe the Green European Foundation has actually made a proposal along these lines so that they were working in the direction of the green and sustainable economy we want to see. So we could, we could allow subsidy for renewable energy and absolutely prevent subsidy for nuclear and fracking, for example. There was one thing which I was very concerned about in Alex's presentation, and that is this thing about refocusing developing countries' economies. Not that I disagree with the principle of it, I agree, I, I agree entirely, but I don't think that's a matter for the EU. We ought to get back to the idea of developing that all countries are independent and responsible for their own policies without interfer interference from the rich and powerful. This is the bit that people on the left always end up with. Let's have a new social movement. I know that it's a cliche. And I also know that it's difficult. One of the key victories, I think, of neoliberalism has been its complete popular victory in the battle of ideas. It's become almost impossible in this country and many others to have a serious debate about alternatives to neoliberalism. They get promoted in universities and they get promoted in the popular press as if they were natural laws rather than human constructs. But we can't leave it at that. We have to fight that, because unless we can start a battle of ideas and win it, just like the neoliberals did themselves back in the 1970s and 80s, then we're screwed, because nobody is going to take alternative ideas seriously. I would also strip from the Commission all its political aspects and turn it into the administration of the European <coughs> Union and all its other institutions. So instead of being this odd beast that it is at the moment, which is half political and half bureaucratic, it would become entirely bureaucratic. And the political elements of the EU would stay with the European Parliament instead, directly elected by the people. Is in your um, vision, wh where is the government? I see the Parliament, I see this two chambers system, but where is the executive? You say the Commission will stay, but uh, more as an administration. And, and so I think we need an executive. We need people who are accountable and who are in, in charge of executive mission, as you understand the national government is. 
the European Parliament has not the right to, to initiate any piece of legislation. And that is, for me, one of the most democratic failures. So to have a kind of mobilization to say, OK, look, it is not acceptable that this European Parliament, which is the only body, transnational body, with direct election, has, no, has not the right to initiative. That would be, I think, a strong signal. I don't know if we will succeed in that, because it means change of the treaty, unanimity, and probably. But at least that the Greens profile themselves on a very clear, one single issue, you know, not to speak too broad thing, not too vague, not too abstract. We have the right to initiate legislation, and especially if there is European citizen initiative, we have the right as MEP to initiate as a, a, a national MP uh, can do it. So I think we have to focus much more on very clear target and trying to build uh, mobilization around these clear targets. Okay. I think what concerns me is this idea that as a, a Europe, we can get to this one singular truth of what is correct. Um, and as long as people focus on this idea of the better Europe, then it, it creates a perception in people's minds that the current policy is deficient in a number of ways. And that can be demotivating, particularly to the youth. Uh, for young people, it's all about future opportunity. Um, and that is the way to sell the EU um, to not only its own citizens, but to the world at this time. You know, as we say on the Greenhouse website, politics is the art of the possible. So the first step is to change what people think is possible, and that's mm -hmm. exactly what Alex is doing. We need to campaign with a forward-looking narrative about Europe being part of a better future. And that's not just about jobs, though. It's not about growth, because we can't have growth. Not if, by, if, by, if we continue to mean by growth the kind of things that our contemporary governments always focus on. What was the response of our government in the UK to the financial crisis? Giving you help to buy a new car. Ridiculous. One thing I would like very much to do is to educate most of the people who work in our media. Wake up understand how the EU works, follow EU political cycles. And that might mean that people that watch the news actually end up thinking that, yes, it's important to go out and vote in the European Parliament elections. Because what happens to the next five-year EU cycle could be absolutely crucial for the fate, not just of this country, but for the, for the future of our continent. It's very easy to forget the fact that Europe's had two terrible world wars over the last century and that the EU has managed to keep the peace within its borders ever since. And I think that that's one thing that as Greens we profoundly value, but everybody should value that really. I found this a very stimulating debate because what Alex is raising is the very profound questions, the basic questions which do need to be readdressed and have been largely forgotten in, the, in this country in particular, about what Europe is, what it's for, what Britain, not, not just Britain, what people's role in it is, how it can be recast, it does need to be recast, and he comes up with some practical proposals for the long term about how it can be done, what needs to be done. I think there was here uh, an agreement that the answer to the crisis, ecological crisis, financial crisis, social crisis, it's not to leave the EU and to be alone in our single country, but to build another future with all partners, the other European people. So it's extremely important to convince people that electing MEPs, and especially green MEPs, is a way to promote alternative policies. I hope that even if the EU isn't as green as I'm suggesting it could be, I very much hope that at least in 20 years' time, the ideas that I've put out in this book don't seem quite so outlandish and don't seem quite so ridiculous. Thank you very much. Thank you.